I thought I'd turn a couple of pens um, using standard kit components but assembling them in ways other than what the instruction sheets say. Well, the first one I wanted to do was this. It's simply the standard kit but with wood made into something looking sort of like segmented. Let me show you how I did it. Well, first thing you do is start off with two pieces of wood that have been milled to three-eighths of an inch thick. Two pieces together becomes three-quarters, which is the thickness of a standard pen blank, which is what I'm shooting for. So with sides smooth and two dissimilar colors of wood, uh, I'm going to glue the two together. Step one. Because they're long and fairly thin, I tend to use a lot of clamps, the purpose of which is to be sure that nothing uh, bends, warps, and that all glue joints are as tight as possible. So a row of clamps on one side, flip it over, a roll of clamps on the other side to even out the pressure. I'm not putting a huge amount of pressure on. I don't want to squeeze the joints dry from wood, but I do want to keep them uh, smooth and flat. So there's a lot of squeeze out, which is an indication I have at least enough glue. <laughs> Certainly maybe more than what I need. So I wait a little bit of time. Glue dries. Clamps come off. And at this point, I have two blanks that are of the right thickness, but of a much greater width than what's necessary. So the process now is to reduce it down to a place where it becomes a square blank. So I've taken off as much as the groove as I can. And now what I'm going to do is try to split it right down the center. Now by eyeball, I get as close to center as I can, make a slight cut, put the saw blade back into that kerf, or make adjustments with the fence until I'm on center. I pretty much get the center of a piece of wood uh, through that technique. So I split it in half. Each piece is still over 3 quarters of an inch wide but now we have two pieces which then can be eventually glued into a square but the edges coming off of the bandsaw are not that smooth for a good glue joint so I'm going to run them through my Performax purpose of which is to get those two faces that are going to be glued next um, as smooth as we can and obviously as flat as we can same thing I have a Performax which uh, gives me the ability to do some really nice work. Not everybody has this, so a sheet of sandpaper uh, on a flat surface would have done equally well. So here's my two pieces. I'm laying them out so there's the square I want. There's the two faces that have to be glued. And let's do the same process all over again. So a bead of glue. Spread it out. And then we're going to clamp these two pieces back together again. Still not quite to three-quarters square. But I am spending a lot of time on sample preparation here for, for your viewing. And also I will cover finishing probably to the same amount of detail. Rest of the steps in between you probably already know from having turned um, many other projects very similar to this one. So I'm clamping them back again. Allowing the glue to set. And then we'll have to bring this piece back into square. So again, time has passed. Glue is dried. Clamps come off. And we now have a piece that is three quarters square on one face, but oversized on the other one. So I'm going to, again, clean up the edges so we have as smooth and parallel surfaces as we can. Formax becomes an easy way to do do that on both faces. So all I'm doing is simply making sure that the uh, glue squeeze out has been totally removed and the faces are as parallel as I can get them. A couple three passes should pretty much do it. Now that looks pretty good to me. So now I need to go back to the bandsaw. And the purpose of which now is to get this into being square. So I've taken some measurements. 
And I figured out how much I need to trim off of each side in order to create a billet that is virtually square. In other words, three quarters on this face and three quarters on the other face. So that trim on each side then should bring it back into relative squareness. Now I'm not going to go back and clean up these edges again. It's not necessary because they're all going to be turned down at this point anyway. But I do have one billet that is quite long, but I know how many eighths slices I'm going to eventually need to create the project I want, so I do need this amount of wood. But it's too hard to manage uh, drilling and cutting, so I'm going to just shorten it into a group of smaller pieces that are easier to handle. Also, drilling really, really long holes is very problematic. So I've cut it into pieces that are uh, just about five inches long. So there's three of those pieces and eh, one little short one. Now when I drill, I like to do it on the lathe. I have uh, components that line up perfectly. And I'm going to use my four jaw chuck to hold that billet of wood as square as I can. And I'm going to use the tailstock Jacob's chuck drill bit combinations to get it as centered as I can. I will start with a center drill. This is something that will be short, stubby, and will put the hole dead in the center and will not wobble. So I use that to create only a pilot. Once that pilot is created on a billet, I can take that bit out and substitute for it the standard seven millimeter drill bit, which now, when driven in, will go dead into the center of that hole and create a perfectly aligned drill. I also go in stages. I'll go a short distance, back out, remove the chips, go a short stage, back out, remove the, the chips again, and keep on until I go all the way through uh, these five inch pieces. If you don't plunge drill in this manner, and the chips heat up, it's quite possible that the drill bit can be pushed off a of center and not create a hole clearly all the way through dead on that center of the four faces of wood. So I'll do all the pieces this way before I cut them into smaller uh, pieces for the project. So again, back to the center drill, then back to the seven millimeter drill until I've prepared all of the pieces. Well, once they're prepared, it's time to cut the slices. And I figured for this project, I want each slice to be approximately an eighth of an inch so that they'll add up to the length of the brass tube just perfectly. So I'm going to set my stop block at one eighth of an inch, 125 thousandths. And that's what I'm doing right now. I'm moving the stop in to exactly the setting on the caliper, locking it. The table on the left is my cutoff frame for holding the piece, but you gotta be sure that all the burrs uh, and any collected sawdust is removed so I'd hold, hold it nice and square. Trim the end, come to the stop, and there's my first eighth slice. And we'll keep going until I processed all of the wood. I know I've got more than I need, but it's better to have extra than not enough. My throat plate for the table saw, as you can see, has a piece of quarter round mounted to it. Uh, forces the slices that are coming off away from the blade. Uh, it looks like they're stacking up a little bit, but they're not flying back and ending halfway across the room. So I'm gonna slice up all the pieces. Now, the tedious part, which I really hate doing, but it's got to be done, and that is to go through each and every one of these, get all those burrs off. Uh, the cutting process is going to create a lot of burrs. I have to go into the hole, too, because the drill hole also has created some burrs, so I'm going through and cleaning the inside of the hole as well as um, the faces. Well, here's my standard kit. I'll take all my components, get them out of the way, but I need the two brass tubes because I'm going to start assembling the project. Uh, before I do that, I rough up all the brasses. The idea being that if the brass is rough, 
the glue will adhere to it better and will have some tooth for it to bite into. So I take a piece of 80 grit sandpaper and carefully scratch the surface of each of the tubes. I've slipped all the little slices onto one of the tubes and I've marked a pencil line down one of the light colored faces. It makes it an alignment mark that I'll use later for checking the rotation uh, as I glue these pieces together. You'll see that coming up just in a minute. So now with thin CA glue, and I use thin because it will penetrate through the end fibers of these slices and lock one slice into the next. So the first one, and now I put the second slice on and using that pencil mark, I'm gonna rotate that second slice so that pencil mark is at the corner of the preceding white piece, just like that. Hold it, a little thin CA glue on top, which will penetrate through the wood and lock those two pieces together. And now it's just a process of putting another piece in place, getting it rotated correctly, holding it in place, putting a drop of CA glue on it. I could wait between each of these and allow the glue to tack, but I've done this a few times and uh, this seems to work just fine. So there's one tube of the pen kit almost completed. And once all the pieces are put in place, I'm going to do one other thing before I move away from this tube, and that is to uh, turn it on its side after it's been spritzed with a little bit of accelerator, and I'm going to flood uh, all the surfaces with a lot of CA glue. Be very liberal with this. So the glue is on the surface, yeah, but I'll turn that away, but it's also sliding between the individual segments to some extent, wicking into that area. So that's one tube that's been glued up and it's ready to go. Now I'm gonna take and do the second tube exactly the same way. Uh, adding the, the thin CA glue, allowing it to set. Once it's totally dry, I'm going to my fixture that allows me to sand the ends of these uh, assemblies dead flat to the tube. Uh, the arm on which this has been inserted is at 90 degrees to the uh, this sander. And what I'm going to do is just gently rub that end until the wood and the brass are flat and on the same plane. I can tell that by looking at the end and seeing shiny brass. And I'll turn it around, do the opposite end for each of these. I know there are devices like this you can now buy commercially. I built this one from other components, um, but now I think Penn State Industries carries a device that is exactly like what I have on this 12-inch uh, disc sander. 80 grit disc on the uh, sander, by the way. So, touched up both surfaces on both blanks. And finally, we're ready to go to the lathe and turn a pen. Well, here we are, uh, bushing one tube the second tube, no bushing in between, and a bushing on the top. I'm establishing the diameter at the top and at the bottom of the pen, but I'm not gonna use any center bands in this project. I'm gonna allow those two pieces of wood to uh, rub against each other. And so I'm gonna turn them in that same manner. So we're set up to do a standard pen turning. Uh, a lot of corners, and a lot of glue, a lot of plastic floating around, so I'm going to use a 3H bowl gouge to do a lot of my roughing and initial shaping. I could probably do 90% here and probably will, and then finish up with a finer tool for the detailed cuts at the very end. I want to be sure not to run into the bushings, but I also want to get as close to them as I possibly can. So we bring it down to its rough shape. A little bit of curvature coming down the, on the end closest to the tailstock will be the top of the pen where the clip goes. 
the portion closest to the headstock of the lathe is where the pen tip will go. So now to clean it up, I'm going to go to my skew chisel. The reason is not only does it uh, cut easily and allow me to get right down to the edge of that bushing without uh, damaging the bushing or over or undercutting the uh, pen blank, but it also gives me a very smooth surface and it will reduce the amount of sanding by a huge amount. So all I'm doing is taking this thing down to the diameter of the two bushings, which establishes the diameters needed for the clip and for the tip of the pen. I sometimes slow this process down a little bit because it's the most fun in turning the pens. Is the part of actually seeing the shape evolve. I turned the skew over and I'm now leading with the long point because it allows me to be able to see where I'm cutting and as I get close to that bushing I want to be sure exactly where I am and I want to be able to have a good line of sight to do that. And so for both ends I'll do the same thing. Light cut, long point leading, and once this is done we won't have a lot of sanding to do. Yeah, I like that. So I'm going to go through sanding, but I'm going to get my dust collection in place first. Sorry for reaching in front of the camera, but that's where the hose was. I'm going to go through a number of grits, get the tool rest out of the way, slow the speed down a little bit here. Uh, we're starting with about 180 on this pass here. And at 180, I can actually do a little bit of shaping if I find a little bump in there I don't particularly like. And I'm sanding on the bottom that allows me to be able to uh, see what's going on. I turn the lathe off at the end of each grit and sand with the direction of the grain, with the lathe off. This removes any of those circular marks that we could be putting on uh, with uh, sanding in the other plane. So I'm finally up to 400 grit, which is probably the final grit that I will actually use. I know you can go much higher if you wanted to. I, I just don't. Same process, sand uh, with the rotation, and then turn the lathe off, wipe the dust, and sand in the direction of the grain by hand. I do this with every grit. Important to get those circular marks gone. Wipe the dust off because that contains grit from that uh, sanding. My last sanding, if you want to call it that, is to sand it with 4 aught steel wool. Uh, steel wool doesn't cut like sandpaper, I mean scratches. It slices more like a plain wood, so it creates a very smooth final surface. So once I've got through that, I have the surface where I want it. And now I'm going to complete the finish. We assemble it with CA, we're going to finish it with CA. So I have a finger cot, a piece of plastic bag, a piece of blue shop towel, and again to my thin CA glue, one coat, and I'm going to continue to rub it with that piece of shop towel until it completely sets. Now the back and forth rubbing is going to make sure that there's no swirly marks and it's smoothed out. And once that's done and dried, I'm back to my 4 aught steel wool to give it one more uh, cleanup. This removes any dust bunnies and any little small particles that might have accumulated. And I'll go back and forth between the last sanding and the steel wool until I get to a place that the steel wool only shows white when I'm sanding on it. That white meaning that it's only acrylic that it's cutting into. There are no wood fibers showing through anymore. And here is my last coat of CA. And I'm going to put it on, rub it on, just as uh, I did all the other coats. Be sure it's absolutely solid before we go on to the next step. I hit it with a little bit of accelerator, um, just to be sure it's totally dry. Finally, 
final coat of steel wool. Eight pass. And now I'm going to get a nice shiny surface on this. Remember this is a CA finish. It's acrylic finish. It's plastic. So I'm going to use Hutt's plastic polish. A uh, little drop of this on my blue shop towel. And this is a polish and what I'm doing now is really bringing up the shine in the plastic. It's not as easy to see on the camera as it is in person but trust me this is really going to cause it to shine a great deal. I'll rub that in. Uh, it has a very fine pumice like material in it which uh, then as you get rubbed off with a dry piece of shop towel. My last step is to take a piece of carnauba wax I'm rubbing it on like a crayon across the uh, pen blank. A carnauba wax is very hard but with pressure from a paper towel the heat will build up and that carnauba wax will melt into the surface and create a really nice shine. It also is nice for the touch. Uh, prevents uh, fingerprints from showing. Feels good when you pick up a pen like that. So as far as I'm concerned, that pen is ready for assembly. So we'll pop it off of the lathe. Take those devices out and I'm going to insert the assembly tools that I use. Uh, these are used on the lathe. It gives me control. I can use the power of the quill for pressure to press pieces into place. So I get them aligned. And then just using the pressure of the tailstock quill, I can put those components together very, very quickly, just like that. And when I go to a, something that's a little different size, like putting the transmission in the other end of the same piece, um, readjusting of the alignment is not that big of a thing. I just back the tailstock off, pull it in place again, lock it down, and drive that uh, transmission into place. I always stop a little short, check it with a pen to see if uh, I've gone the right distance. In this case, I have not. So I now know how far farther I need to push uh, the transmission in. And I'll test it again. And I like that extension. That looks pretty good. So I have to now build the top, put the clip onto the top. So there's the clip assembly. And it's just pressed into place. And now the job is basically done. There's my pen. So we got the job done, but look at all the stuff that's still left over. I did have a lot more pieces than I thought. So I took the remaining pieces and with a couple of extra blocks of wood because I didn't have quite enough pieces, I built a second pen out of the leftovers. And so here goes uh, a top and a bottom. And we're doing precisely the same thing we just did all before. So there's two more blanks. And in the end, we have the pen we set out for. And we have a second bonus pen came with the project. Hope this helped you. I hope you enjoyed the video. We'll see you next time.